Welcome to Thought in Motion, a series dedicated to the seminars of the psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan. Today's video is on Lecture 18 in Seminar 1 entitled The Symbolic Order. If you enjoy this video, please consider liking it, sharing it, and subscribing to my channel. In this video, I'll address the following questions. 1. How does Lacan's analysis of intersubjectivity relate to Hegel's master-slave dialectic? And 2. What is meant by the gap of being? Lacan begins this lecture summarizing the previous talk focusing on the gaze and perversion. The two concepts are connected in that the gaze is revealed through perversion. In the example of sadism, the sadist sustains desire through the gaze of the one being tormented. This entire situation is a kind of limit experience that unfolds in the imaginary, but is implicitly structured by the symbolic. Lacan refers to the master-slave relation developed by Hegel to illustrate this. As such, it may be helpful, as we did with Sartre, to unpack this section in the Phenomenology of Spirit to better understand Lacan's thinking. In the section entitled Independent and Dependent Self-Consciousness, Lordship and Bondage, from the Phenomenology of Spirit, Hegel indicates that recognition is at the core of human desire, but recognition is always mediated through the other, who must be another subject rather than a mere object for us. I can only see myself in another who sees me as I see them. When I do, I gain the possibility of receiving their recognition that I desire. However, desire for Hegel consumes what it enjoys by making the thing of one's enjoyment entirely part of one's consciousness, kind of like assimilating food. If my desire was completed, I would then lose the other subject who recognizes me. We can see quite clearly at this moment uh, the parallels to Lacan's discussion on perversion, which goes to the limit of recognition by sustaining desire in a precarious state of uncertainty between turning the other into an object and in recognizing the other as a subject. The sadist plays within that gap produced by the seesaw of desire within the specular relation. Now, how does this search for recognition transpire for Hegel? Well, first, at the beginning, we're a pure being for itself. We relate to ourselves in our immediacy. And here, immediacy refers to a kind of undeveloped elementary relation to life. It's a relation that delivers self-certainty but not knowledge or truth. Mediation, by contrast, is a conceptualization, a reflection upon the things of the world. It brings two or more things together in a relation under a third thing, a concept that unifies the other two. My immediate relation to myself is an immersion within life before reflection, but upon becoming aware of another subject who is a subject like myself, self-consciousness is achieved in acquiring knowledge about myself through the other. We can think of the example of Sartre's Peeping Tom discussed in the last video as an example of this, and not coincidentally since Sartre's analysis is heavily indebted to Hegel. So as such, consciousness must externalize itself in grasping the other as another subject, who in turn is doing the same. This interplay between two consciousnesses gives rise to the third term, which is self-consciousness. Again, we see here parallels to how Lacan uh, suggests the symbolic enters into the imaginary relation. To arrive at this self-consciousness, to move from a being for itself to a being for the other, requires risking our lives by entering a struggle to the death with the other. The risk here in seeking the death of the other is that the other becomes recognized as someone who may seek my own death as well. This is the first moment of realizing the subjectivity of the other. The threat of death awakens us from the immediacy of life as we now have to consider what the other is thinking so as to avoid the harm they may deliver. Lacan frames this struggle as a dialectic of the gaze in which I imagine the other's detection of my intentions, where I'm going and so where I'm currently not. This then requires a kind of self-reflection about my own intentions as I now seek to disguise them from the other. In other words, I learn to lie. Doing this requires that I look at my thoughts through the eyes of the other. Without making the comparison too strongly, we see here something like a Hobbesian state of nature, a kind of war of all against all. 
but the comparison is not completely accurate since though engraved in this struggle, what I truly desire is recognition. If I kill the other, I would gain a fleeting moment of satisfaction, but when I annihilate the other, I also lose the possibility of gaining recognition from them. As such, the next best option is to get the upper hand and turn the other into a slave and require them to uh, set aside their being for itself and exist solely for the master. This is what establishes the master-slave relation. It's also the position of the dominant in relation to the submissive. The master exists only for itself, whereas the slave is compelled to be for the other, the master. Slaves are put in relation to things that they must mediate for the master who can then enjoy them. The way Lacan puts this is that the master establishes their superiority in the dual relation. This imaginary relation then opens the possibility for the law to be imposed upon the slave, requiring that they engage in labor for the jouissance of the master. Again, if we return to the example of sadism, we can think of the dominant and the submissive is not purely in an objective relationship, but there are rules. There's the safety word, so to speak, that actually governs the entire relation. After reading this lecture, I've been thinking it, someone should write an essay or do a video on uh, the Lacanian way of looking at the Fifty Shades of Grey series. I'm not sure if I'll do that one day, but just a thought for anyone out there. The difficulty in this arrangement is that the master cannot get any genuine recognition from the slave, as that would require the other be an independent self-consciousness, and the master can't allow for the slave to become that. So the truth of the master remains located in the slave, which the master can't gain access to, and the slave, at least at first, has no consciousness of possessing. Now Hegel will go on in this section to describe how the slave who possesses this truth may achieve his own independent self-consciousness, but I think for the purpose of uh, this lecture of Lacan today, We've covered some of the important points, and I'm sure we'll return to this again in the future. So let us move now to the second question for today. What is the gap of being? After a discussion on Balin's understanding of transference, Lacan addresses the function of speech, noting that it always has an ambiguous backdrop, a place which is beyond speech and so ineffable. This beyond of speech is within the very dimension of speech itself as what is hollowed out in the experience of speech. This hollowed out dimension of speech is called the gap of being. It's where in analytic experience one locates the subject. Lacan will later on describe this introduction of the symbolic as a cut in the real. Now with this in mind, let's move a few pages backwards where on 228, Lacan notes that the start of the analytic experience involves mendacious speech, or speech that lies. Lacan states that, in fact, speech makes lying possible because speech makes possible judgments of truth and falsity by introducing what is and what is not. This is not to deny that there's some underlying reality, something hard and durable that's there before language, but things don't exist for us until they are brought into speech that is, until they're mediated. This is a strange notion to get our minds wrapped around since we typically consider existence as a kind of precondition for everything else. This is where we have to keep in mind the Hegelian influence and the distinction between immediacy and mediation. Mediation, which in this case is speech, allows for truth. Prior to this, we lack the reflective consciousness necessary to know things and so lack access to the truth. For Lacan, this nothing, this before being, is the real. Now this raises some questions that well, we won't get any answers to today, uh, and will have to be things we'll return to in the future. Like for example, if the real is prior to being, how does it function, if at all? We'll later see how the real, though it does not possess being, still exists meaning that there remains a kind of pushing out into and through being that itself does not possess being, a kind of radical otherness at the center of ourselves. And we'll certainly elaborate upon this idea over time. As always, thank you for watching. 
We'll next move into the final section of seminar one entitled Speech in the Transference. I look forward to seeing your invisible gazes then.